this could be a, a tough thing for, for many of us to realize. Uh, we're not often being hired because we're genius rowing coaches. Mm -hmm. We're being hired because someone trusts us to be the adult to run this group of 40, 60, 80, 100 adolescents in a, in a safe and productive manner. Welcome to the Rowing Resource Podcast. This is Travis Gardner, and my guest today is Ali Rosenblatt. Ali is the technical manager and web developer for Road 2K. Ali has also been coaching at the youth level since 2001, starting his career at Deerfield Academy in Massachusetts before moving down south to Bowles School in Jacksonville. From there, he moved to Thayer Academy and is now coaching at the Duxbury Bay Maritime School in Massachusetts. Ali started rowing himself back in 1985 and continued his career in college at Rutgers University, where he was a member of the Varsity Lightweight 8 for three years, before continuing his career on the national and international level, which he pursued through the 90s, and uh, then settled into his roles at Row 2 k and in coaching at the end of that decade. Uh, Ali was also involved in rowing news before Road to K and so has extensive experience between those two in the media and journalism side of the sport, which we dive into in the second part of our conversation today. The first part of our conversation just focuses on uh, that youth rowing and the challenges that coaches face with that age group. We talk about the pressures that uh, wanting to be competitive places on the decisions that we make in terms of what is best developmentally for those athletes at the stage. Uh, we talk about working through a variety of challenges, both on the athlete to coach level, the coach to parent administrator level. Uh, we talk about the challenges that an environment can present, whether it's rough water, whether it's limited equipment. And a current favorite topic of mine, which is balancing our own health and wellness as coaches while we are focused on our careers, family, and shepherding that next generation of rowers. That being said, let's go ahead and get into the episode. This is Ollie Rosenblatt. Ollie, thanks for making the time to talk today. Thanks for having me, Travis. Yeah, so we were, we were sharing ideas in terms of, you know, topics that we want to talk about. And actually, one of the final notes that, that you said kind of really kind of caught my eye and, and kind of a good jumping off point, and that was talking about how the pressures of, of, of training youth rowing have evolved over the last couple of decades. You know, and I kind of, when we were talking before this, I kind of described it almost like an arms race mm -hmm. for teaching youth athletes and how that kind of drive and the pressures to be competitive are often at odds with the health and wellness of those young athletes mm -hmm. because they are still very much in the, in the developmental stage. Even in the, in the 10, 12 years that I was at Essex between 2007, you know, 2018, a lot of kind of changes there in terms of the expectations that the athletes brought into the training and, and those athletes pressures that they got from parents and then through the recruiting process and uh, you know for me it's always been the role as the youth coaches is really to you know do no harm for one you know for all coaches you know but also primarily is to establish a foundation for the athlete to be successful mm -hmm. later and not to just prioritize that kind of short term because I think if you know any any knowledgeable coach understands that there are there are shortcuts to training. You know, everyone likes to say there's no shortcuts to training. There there are definitely things that you can do that are going to provide quick bursts of speed for those athletes. You know, over a month to month before you kind of hit a drop. You know, and it may you can temper that a little bit, and you may you know be able to make it six months, seven months, but eventually there's going to be um, you're going to have to pay the piper, as it were. And so, you know, for you. Where have those pressures come? What have you seen since those early days at Deerfield right. Academy to kind of where you are now here at Duxbury? Um, I think we've seen a lot of, um, well, f first of all, let me just say, I, I think that, that a lot of the things that are happening in, in youth rowing in the United States are, are phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, you have so many good coaches now working at the youth level, um, experienced folks, they, they are, and, and you see this in the performance of our, our junior national teams, mm -hmm. um, athletes matriculating onto college, uh, but you see so much high quality work, technical training work, athlete development, I mean, across, across the disciplines. I mean, if you had told me 15 years ago that, that we would see the U.S. win a Junior Worlds in a sculling event, I would have laughed. But yeah. there, there you had, you know, the Y Quad Cities double that won at the Worlds, the Junior Worlds in, in 2016. I mean, that was, that was amazing. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that you, you have this amazing growth and knowledge and this outpouring of people doing great work Certainly, it's benefited, I think, our collegiate programs, our junior national team, rowing across all levels. Um, one thing you, you said earlier, which, which I think you, know, you, 
you, you told a brief anecdote of, of this athlete who you know, you'd seen develop from the middle school level to the high school level. To me, that growth is the great magic of, of junior rowing. I mean, you, you as, as a collegiate coach, I think more often than not, you get more or less a, a finished product. And, and at the high school level, you are present kind of at the beginning and this, this phenomenal growth curve. I love the growth curve. I think yeah, it's, it's, no. it's, it, it rewards you as a coach. Um, certainly you see the results in terms of increased speed and better results in, right. your, in your racing. But I think that the growth curve and, and the experience of the, of the kid, when they, when they take step upon step upon step into larger and larger worlds. And, you know, again, in our case, we measure things either by their ERG score or by, you know, how they're, what boat they're in or, or by how their team is performing. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think being on hand to see those major developments um, from kids from 14 to 18 or, or 19 is phenomenal. I mean, that's, that's been the great gift of coaching junior rowing is, is you are, are present for some amazing human growth opportunities. Mm -hmm. Where I think, you know, all the success and all this growth has, um, I don't necessarily want to call it a dark side, but definitely something that, that occasionally leaves me wondering about, you know, making sure we, we, we stay ethical, stay, continue right. to do the right thing. I mean, you mentioned, you mentioned do no harm is what level of volume, training volume, investment in rowing on a year-round basis is appropriate for, for high school kids. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I have the answer. I've seen it, I've seen it in many different ways, and I, I think I've yet to really figure out the common thread. I think if there's one common thread, certainly it's quality. Mm -hmm. um, when I started out at the, uh, the boarding school level at, at Deerfield almost 20 years ago, the kids did a sport in the fall, they did a different sport in the winter, maybe one or two would drift down to you know, one or two lonely ergs that were you know, next to the squash courts. Yeah. And then you got them for a, a training trip, you got them for that, that sort of third week of March and you went somewhere, you went to Cambridge, you went to Virginia, you went to Florida, you rode and then you came back and then you trained for a month and then you raced and then you know, 10 weeks later everything was over. Yeah. If you were lucky, some of those kids would do a development camp over the summer whether it was racing at Club Nationals or Henley or both, then they'd come back in September and they'd join the soccer team again and you wouldn't see them until the following March. So right. sort of doing, doing the math there, you would see kids, especially if they didn't row over the summers, who might go through high school and at the end of four years, they'd done 40 weeks of rowing, right. which is less than a full year. Yeah. And then on the, the flip side, you'd have... Uh, you'd have club teams where the kids would row fall, winter, spring, uh, you know, with a winter training block in there. I saw some of this when I moved to the, the bowl school in, in, in Jacksonville, where it truly was a year-round mm -hmm. year rowing program. Obviously, it's Florida. You can stay out for right. most of the year. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if they liked it when I made them erg in the winter. <laughs> um, it's like, coach, it's nice outside. Well, yeah. uh, this is what you know, yeah. real rowing involves, involves some erging. And so there's definitely, I think, been a, a creep in the amount of hours that the, kids, that the kids do. And certainly that's been reflected in the growth of, of junior rowing. But I think, again, if you look at some of the great New teams up here in New England who do sort of really only row in the spring and the phenomenal athletes they're generating, I think there's reason to believe that you don't need to specialize. Uh, certainly, I don't know, and again, having, having and this, is, this was one of your other questions, having seen it from the boarding school level and the public school level and the, 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 the day school quasi-club quasi, quasi club, club yeah. level, th there's definitely a difference in the quality of athletes, certainly. I think if you, have, if you have phenomenal athletes, you can row 10 weeks a year and your boats will go fast and these yeah. kids, on the basis of being phenomenal athletes, are very recruitable and they will contribute at, at really any level where you Yeah, I mean, through Essex, I mean, we were a club community program and we, we trained year round. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we definitely didn't encourage the athletes to, to, to do that year round, mm -hmm. but we didn't stop them if that was right. the decision. Um, and we were right next to Phillips Academy and over, you know, and looking there and, you know, it always kind of, you know, I marveled at how the prep schools, right. you know, can be so successful with such a, a mm -hmm. short uh, training period. And then um, even this last fall, you know, Exeter needed some help because one of their, their coaches on sabbatical. So I, you know, stepped in and helped there. It was kind of a chance for me to get a little insight into that world. Right. And, and the revelation was really that 
they're phenomenal athletes. Mm -hmm. You know that there's it's you know it's the it's the quality of the clay that you're using to to to, to craft your pot. You yeah. know, and so I mean, if, uh, institutions like those are just there's much higher recruitment standards, mm -hmm. and and that kind of transfers both to the physical assets of those athletes, mm -hmm. but also you know kind of in a sport like rowing, it's like it's it's difficult to be successful as a rower without having the the capacity to understand the nuance of moving a boat you know yeah. and so if, if you're academically strong you know and you have that that intellectual mm -hmm. keenness then that's going to be an asset in rowing right. you know more than maybe some other sports right. and so so yeah i mean i think it, it, it comes back to that that quality and you know but you know like we're saying I mean, those athletes you know they might graduate with 40 40 weeks mm -hmm. of, of rowing behind their belts right. and uh and then you know but that also goes kind of into that that decision making as a coach um and and for those teams they you know they might have four weeks you know to get an athlete from never having touched an oar to to racing and it's like what's in a club environment we would never do that you know and, and generally we're looking at 10 to 12 weeks before mm -hmm. an athlete's going to enter a head race um which is you know for a novice athlete that's essentially a really hard long training piece right. you know um whereas you know those athletes in the prep school they're that's the, this is the spring they're hopping into a 1500 meter you know so very high much higher skill right. intensive uh, demand that's being placed on them and i just I, I think about it and i wonder you know is the is the competitive format and environment detrimental to those athletes development because another thing that i did see at exeter while you know there were phenomenal athletes the technical ability of the athletes was far below kind of what we would expect you know and what i had seen at the club level even though those they're com they're comparable in terms of the competitiveness on the right. water and those those schools they kind of follow in the same model as other sports because mm -hmm. you can have someone that's never kicked a soccer ball before and you can very right. safely throw them you know out onto a soccer field after right. four weeks of practice right. for their first ever game but it's a very different ball game for rowing and so right. people are taking those principles of you know what kind of works for other sports into something like rowing where it's uh right. you know I, th I think the key is that there's when you're rowing there's there's so much you're in an environment dominated by momentum and it's not momentum that you are generating yourself when you're in a boat you're contributing to that and then once you've contributed to it it's kind of out of your hands in terms of what the other rowers are doing what the boat is right. doing and that's kind of where that kind of danger and development or injury creation kind of comes in right. so it's curious i mean i i have no idea how people would I think, well, again, I, I think the simplest, to me, the simplest explanation is you want it to be fun so they come back. I mean, yeah. that sounds, if, if we were, you know, if we all take our, our old FISA manuals from the 80s out and we, we, we pull out one of Thor Nielsen's sheets and it's got, you know, 40K of, of steady state on, yeah. on Monday, um, you know, you look at your freshman from Duxbury High School and you think, there's no way. I mean, he won't come back on Tuesday. Yeah. Um, not simply from the volume, but because at some levels, um, especially now in the you know in in, in the 21st century, uh, maybe that's a, maybe that's a little boring. Yeah. So I think one of the 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 big things, at least that I've learned in coaching high school, is you need to develop a, a, a certain amount of trickery. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you need to you need to trick people into into doing the work and, and, and then you can start to grow them into the volume. But I think that in terms of this idea of, you know, let's follow the, the, the template of, you know, making sure everyone's, you know, rode for 10 weeks before they, they race for the first time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, that, that will probably, that will probably work. And maybe that's the, the, the letter of, of, you know, training and, and, and rowing common sense. But I think the reality for most people is, uh, you know, let's just go out and see what happens. See what's see what kind of repeatable patterns mm -hmm. you can you can make. See what's fun for people. And by fun, I think you definitely don't want to be loosey goosey. There has to be method to your to your madness. But I think that keeping things active and variable, especially at, at the at the high school level, you can definitely get. I think both the volume and the intensity and the quality that mm -hmm. you need you know, rather than needing to say, okay, you know, we're going to, we're going to row, you know, we're going to row 10 miles of steady state for the first a, a day for the first two weeks, just to make sure everyone knows how to, how to hold an oar. I mean, I think, I do think you have to spice it up on occasion. I mean, I think that the, the, the key word again is, um, and this is where we're having coach for a while helps, I think, mm -hmm. is look at the quality. What does the rowing look like? Yeah. How do your kids look? 
and then certainly how do they do on their assessments if they're making regular progress on your on your physiological assessments on the erg or what have you then you're probably in good shape yeah and i mean i think you hit it on the head it's like is you've got to keep it interesting you've got to mix it up and that comes with the to the skill of the coach in terms of making sure that it is an engaging process right. and that you know certainly you can step back and be like we're going to do steady state for 10 weeks and drills right. for 10 weeks right. If you do that, you're going to fail. But right. you know, you can. You there's, and this is you know, and you talked about kind of you know playing tricks. And mm -hmm. I mean, I think that novice coaches need to have a full appreciation mm -hmm. of the the canvas that they've been given in terms of the athlete right. Right. and the ignorance and naivete of that athlete coming in. And I right. think that you know that that athlete's coming in and they're they're engaged in this new activity, mm -hmm. and the coach kind of has all the this this. Santa's bag of presents that right. they're, you know, and, but most coaches are like, here's a present, here's a present. Oh, you like that? Well, here's another present, here's another present. And uh, instead of being like, oh, well, we're gonna, we're gonna open to this present, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, explore this new aspect of the sport, and then we're gonna kind of wait right. and then do that next one. And, and for me, it was kind of, you know, <laughs> you know, I like to develop an athlete very patiently, but I realized that, you know, you, you have to keep them engaged in the mm -hmm. process. And so there would be, there's little things that, you know, I would just throw in to kind of keep it, keep it a little fun. And if you add the competitive aspect, you know, that's there too. But it would be something as simple as, you know, in the first three days, you know, we're spending our time on the erg, but we kind of limited that to maybe, you know, 20, 30 minutes, you know, for the first talking and trying. And then we get off the erg, we go outside and we're like, this is a boat, right. you know, and this is the oar and this is how you put the oar. And, you know, maybe we'll go to this is how you pick up a boat. Right. And then you don't do anything more. And then the next day you're doing your more drills in there. And then you, you know, you stop it. You know, once you, their attention starts to drift and we're like, all right, well now we're just going to bring the boat down to the water, or maybe we're just going to walk the boat around the field. And for them, this is all, they're like, oh my gosh, I just right. carried this, you know, 60 foot long boat around the field. This right. is new. Isn't it? Whereas varsity row is like, right. well, that's all you did. Mm -hmm. um, and coaches sometimes don't appreciate the novelty right. of, of those little tiny things. And so, and if you're just, carefully sparsing out those little kind of new things, mm -hmm. um, then, then that's the way to kind of keep them engaged. And, so, and with the competitive side too, it's like you can, you know, you can be competitive with very simple things. You know, yeah. it's like that first day novice, it's yeah. just like, all right, at the end of practice, let's take 10 strokes and let's see who can get the lowest split. And, you know, we take 10, everybody calls out their exactly. split and we yeah. go and it, it's not like, all right, first day, let's see how we do for 500 meters or, you know, right. well, let's race for a minute, you know, or, or certainly things like that. It's just, you keep it little. And when you're on the water, it's, you know, do we need to throw these guys into a head race or can we just do some, you know, racing by fours, you know, get them a nice stable platform, you know, whoever gets, you know, bout a stern on the other boat first, you know, is winning. And, you know, so you got to be creative in that. And I th and think that's where, you know, like you say, you kind of, you kind of come, come away from the brink in terms of pushing into those mm -hmm. situations that mm -hmm. that could cause issues mm -hmm. you know whether it's injury or whether it's even motivational right. because I think it's I think as a as a as a novice coach even a varsity coach putting the athletes into race situations where they they are not going to succeed you know and it's not going to feel good mm -hmm. it's bad and that doesn't have to mean you're winning right. but it just you know it should right. mean you know, you've had a great piece, you know, right. and come off proud of that and not being like, oh my gosh, that was horrible. I can't believe we survived, right. you know, that process. And I think that, you know, if you're, if you're tactical in how you're kind of applying those little things that you'll, you'll have more success kind of in the long term. And those where kind of, you know, those competitive pressures kind of sometimes get in the way. And especially for your own coach that doesn't have like us, that, that bag of tricks, you know, and how to do it, you know, unless they have somebody saying, you know, do this or don't do that or don't go too fast and just kind of keep their interest in this right. way or this other way, then, you know, it's, I mean, it's going to be 10 years before they figure out, you right. know, what the rest right. of us have figured out through trial and error, right. you know, along that way. Yeah. That said, um, I do say one thing that I've come to appreciate, I'd say in my sort of second decade of high school coaching mm -hmm. is keep your eyes and, and your mind open for the surprise. Mm. Um, so early on, again, going back to my experience coaching springs only at the, the boarding school level, early on, you know, our, 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 uh, our spring training trips, you know, were on nice water, no one else around, low steady state, the rate's never above 18. And so, and so for the first, I'd say five, six, seven years, that was the model. Mm. Like we're gonna, you know, by Thursday, maybe we're Maybe we're going to, you know, do some side-by-side -side stuff, add a little pressure to the oar, 
you know, certainly I've always heeded Mike Tatey's advice, you know, it's like, don't do an urge test right after the end of vacation because it's going to be awful. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you push the 2K or the test either back into the end of that, that train week or, or later. And so what I did um, where, that, where that changed was for us at Deerfield when we started, when we started going, to, going to Florida. And so when you go, again, uh, in Florida, the school year ends a lot earlier, so all the race, the racing calendar has shifted much mm-hmm. earlier. So when we got when we got down there and we started training, we realized everyone was already racing, and so I decided we'd enter a race. Yeah. We, we, we'd, we'd enter a race on five days of rowing, yeah. and it was actually it was actually phenomenal. Mm-hmm. I mean, the the the, the kids, um, and this was again with a few new kids in the boat each year. You know, you have your new varsity walk-ons, mm-hmm. athletes from other sports. And so there were definitely kids who were having their first side-by-side experience wearing a, you know, wearing a uniform or wearing their spring break t-shirt yeah. um, on five days of rowing. And, and I, I would say to a, to a body, it was, um, it was incredibly exciting for these kids because... Well, those, those are, that's not a full boat of the new people, right? No. We're saying you're mixing them in. Yeah, which is... They're mixed in for right. sure. But this idea that as a coach, you're open to that surprise. Like, all right, let's see. I don't know if I can pull this off. Yeah. I'm kind of right on that, that ragged edge of, hey, this might be a crazy thing. But, yeah. um, you know, we were doing pieces by Wednesday. It was, a, it was that, you know, the year we started doing that, we had a very special group of athletes who were, who were very... Um, I would say not necessarily just physically gifted, but, but they had, um, they were so open to any challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, that's also a facet of coaching youth rowing is don't underestimate the ability of your kids to surprise you, mm-hmm. sometimes of their own accord. I mean, certainly motivation and, and being a person who makes these kids feel like they're part of something really important and like, hey, you know, this team is a, this team is a big deal, mm-hmm. um, bring something to the boathouse every day. You, you do want to be open to surprises. Mm-hmm. Uh, your team will surprise you, uh, certainly occasionally in a negative way. They are yeah. teenagers. But often enough, they will surprise you in a really positive way. Um, and not just on the performance side, but on the side of where they will take your challenge and they'll run with it and they'll make something new of it that you didn't think was, was possible. Yeah, and I think, you know, we, we, we joked about that with when I was talking with Justin Moore about... Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, we were talking about illness and, and kind of athletes rowing when they're ill and how some of the athletes had kind of figured out that uh, that some of those surprises happen. You know, someone is out of the boat, you know, because they're ill and someone steps in and all of a sudden it's like, what, yeah. what is that athlete doing? Mm-hmm. You know, what's happening here? And then, you know, to where the athletes there were like, well, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to mispractice or sick because they don't want to lose right, the seat. Right, right. But, uh, but yeah, or even, you know, kind of from, from my experience, um, you know, just the challenge of attendance and, you know, yeah. and the, and the, and the other obligations that the athletes have, mm-hmm. you know, just causing me to kind of constantly move and change the lineup, you know, not doing what is ideal every single day. And every once in a while you're like, Ooh, that athlete who, you know, I just, uh, you know, I wasn't focused on, um, Someone you know, now that up. I'm looking up there, you know, something yeah. happens, there's some, there's some magic that's happening there. And, um, and also kind of going back to what you were talking about, of, of putting those novices in with those varsity for that experience. I mean, I think that's something we would do a lot, you know, with, with our novices. And it requires, uh, it requires a very cohesive team environment, yes, you know, I between, agree. you know, one between the coaches that the, that the leadership and the coaches has kind of created that cohesive environment. And then the athletes, you know, kind of getting out of this kind of, you know, odd hierarchical um, kind of uh, way of thinking that tends to dominate just any team or any group of, of people. Um, and being open to that idea. And, and, and for me, with a lot of my time, you know, I was in charge of both of the novice and varsity. And in that case, it was very easy kind of as we're developing to just, you know, f- pick out those novices that are developing really fast and just, you know, push them into a varsity boat. Mm-hmm. You know, you put one very high performing or maybe even two high, very high performing novices in a, in a varsity boat. That's just doing rowing by sixes. And maybe they, you know, spend a couple minutes rowing by eight at the end. They're, they're really going to excel, and then they take that experience back to the novices, and then they can kind of, it's kind of this trickle down of, of skill, right. and the same thing with racing, too. You just kind of, if, you, if you're putting those, those, um, those athletes in and surrounding them with the experience, you're really going to jumpstart their development level, because, you know, it, it, it is hard for just, you know, eight people who've never rode before to get from that day one to racing successfully without any direct exposure to experienced rowing, you yes. know, to, to follow it. Yes. Even, even ideas like yeah. 
you know, I remember when I was a novice and the first time I've, I've got into a varsity builder, I was like, oh, that's what they mean by slide control. Right. <laughs> you know, right. it's just like you think you understand the concept right. and then you experience mm -hmm. it and it's a totally different ball game. And so, you know, I definitely, for coaches, I, I think that's a critical skill. And, you, you know, for the head coaches to create an environment where that is embraced by the athletes mm -hmm. and then, you know, and then, you know, taking the time out of that, you know, that kind of urgency of your varsity training to be like, we're going to develop the next generation for a day or two here and may plant those seeds for the future and, and kind of be able to step away from the plan, right. you know, as yeah. it were, I think is, yeah. is really invaluable. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I'm curious and, and looking here, we talked about the challenge of kind of developing those early people, you know, and, you know, I can't, this is a really cool school. And we were talking about Duxbury kind of when I got here and kind of how it's set up as kind of community access, you know, for, you know, the maritime, you know, activities, you know, be it rowing or, you know, boating, sailing. Um, but, you know, if people see in the video, the background there of the water, you know, that, that's challenging water. Mm -hmm. and, and you guys predominantly row fours, if I'm yes, correct. Really. And mm -hmm. so, and I would say the four is probably the hardest boat, mm -hmm. I think, to teach yes, novices the, the, in. Yes, you know, a, the, um, the Cox four is, is very hard yeah. for that reason. Um, for the reason of our, our beautiful bay here, yeah, yeah. Um, we do keep our novices in eights okay. for much of their much of their first year. It's more stable from right. a safety perspective. I think more of us have seen Cox fours go over than we've seen eights go over. Certainly, um, it, it it happens, mm -hmm. and so you know, going along with the concept of the novice program as a wide open door, mm -hmm. um, it's it's forgiving. It's not as pressure filled. It's not necessarily as it's quality oriented, but it's not performance oriented. So we want to give people the enjoyable experience of rowing for the first time, racing for the first time. And I think the way you do that is you give someone a slightly more stable platform, mm -hmm. given difficult water, you give them, you know, that sense of that sense of security. Um, with the varsity kids, even when you know what you're doing, it can be tough. Yeah. Um, I think, I think any, uh, you know, having having rode and 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 raced all over the place, I think there's no perfect there's no perfect rowing environment. Mm -hmm. There's there's cruel water everywhere, and it, I think again, um, going back to to your statement at the at, at the beginning of the talk, I think you, you do have to do no harm. I mean, not just um, I, I welcome the new the re, you know the new sort of more <laughs> intensive focus on safety in our sport. Mm -hmm. um, because a flip side of, of more and more access and more and more participation is, um, and again, you know, sort of along with the competitive pressures, comes a, a maybe a tendency to ride that edge a little bit, uh, go out and row in questionable conditions, mm -hmm. try to steal a row here and there. You know, we've, we've managed. There, there have been times where we've had to decamp from here and find an alternate body of water. Mm -hmm. The, the tendency of the weather here is, is occasionally that it's better in the morning. So sometimes you bite the bullet and you, you, you take a week in the mornings. And I think this too goes back to what you were talking about at the beginning, where you, you have to balance all of these factors. I don't think it's as simple as just saying, well, the best water is always in the morning. So we're going to do every practice in the morning. I mean, if you're 16, if you're up at five o'clock every, every day, and then there, you know, there's all the other stuff, your other activities after school and, and what have you. Is that too steep a price to pay? I don't know. Um, I think that, that you, you have to examine all of these aspects and not just say, be in your, in your tunnel and say, I'm only considering what is best for my crew or my team mm. right now. Um, I think the big thing with rowing on rough water is being amenable to changing your plan. You would, you would acknowledge the plan earlier. I mean, I'm a compulsive planner. I keep, I keep grids and, and I have, you know, my three weeks and my one week and, and my lineups. And um, you certainly never want to junk everything completely. And you do have to keep a long-term eye on your goals. Right. But at the same time, I think, and, and this can be the toughest thing to do as a coach when you have a race in three days and you know, mother nature and school and, and the schedule is are, are, are sort of conspiring to, to, to what looks like, you know, really wreck your weekend. Yeah. Um, and so I think you, you, you do have to have that sort of mental capacity, that patience to be able to alter your plan, do what you can 
Um, it's an overused phrase, but don't let the, the perfect be the enemy of the good. Right. Um, do what you can. Maybe you do shorter pieces. Maybe you, you tuck your pieces, what was going to be five minute pieces. Maybe you tuck something in to that one little patch of water that you're mm -hmm. now sharing with 12 boats. You know, get everybody side by side. Get the hard strokes in. Um, there are de and there are definitely some days where if I feel like I'm not going to do major harm to my, my, my athletes or my team, that we will do a full workout in truly crummy conditions. Mm -hmm. um, I think, um, again, at, at neither at Deerfield nor at, at Bowles nor, nor here have I ever blessed with sort of truly forgiving water. Mm -hmm. And just that experience of getting to a championship after you know, a month of, of training on really crummy water and then you get one of those days where Quinn Sigmund is like a sheep yeah. and the kid's eyes are like this and they're like, oh yeah, let's go. <laughs> because th they know this is, you, you know, they can, they, can handle, they can handle the good stuff. They're excited yeah. for the good stuff. Or conversely, I've also seen, you know, days where um, being able to persevere in rough conditions has led to good racing outcomes mm. if the race happens in, in, in poor conditions. Right. Yeah. Um, so again, um, there's a fine line between great coaching and torture. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, can, you can truly ruin your week if you push too hard in rough conditions. I mean, I think the thing that, that even those of us who, who were formerly athletes um, or formerly you know, rowing athletes, whether on teams or in small boats, is that different than most other sports, I think rowing in, in rough water uh, tires you out in a very different way than, than rowing hard mm -hmm. in calm water, calm water. It's a That's very different, point. it's a yeah. very different kind of, of tired and fatigue. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if it's the best day and we go out and we're going to do three minute pieces at, at base cadence and say, it, say it's flat mm -hmm. and you ramp up your, your four or five three minute pieces, the rates are really high. At the end of that day, you're going to have pretty sore quads. You're going to have, you know, you know, feel that you've done, you've done work that day. You're going to sweat a lot. But if you try to do that same workout in 12 inch chop or in, in, in high winds where the oars are tapping water, you're fighting environmental conditions such as, mm -hmm. such as wind, there's water in the boat, you fatigue physically and mentally, I think, in a very different way. So if you do choose to do the work, and I, I do think there's a, there's a place for that, yeah. for doing the work in, in, in challenging conditions, um, do realize that, you're, that your people get fatigued in a very different way than they would doing the same work on on calm water that's an interesting point i and i don't hear too many people talk about it but mm -hmm. I, you know certainly you experience it it's like it's more of a um it's more of a strength workout you know and in the results the fatigue is more of a kind of the strength versus that just kind of pure lactate accumulation because right. you're not you're, you aren't building the same right. kind of lactate right. concentrations you know when you're rolling mm -hmm. in that rough water and you know i had a funny experience rowing at, at Philadelphia, you know, early in my intermediate career, the first it's season. Nice in Philly. It's always oh, yeah, sunny it's gorgeous in Philly, in Philly right? Yeah. And um, and we had, uh, yeah, I was rowing out of Malta at the time, and um, we were racing an intermediate double, and we were average speed. You know, we weren't spectacular that season, and um, that morning I'd, eat, I'd eaten a huge breakfast and it was too close to race time. You know, and I went out and we kind of we it was fine water. We mm -hmm. did our race. You know, um, you know, I definitely kind of held us back because I wasn't performing. And I think we we placed like one boat out of qualifying, mm -hmm. and then it turned out that somebody that qualified, you know, did something they weren't supposed to. They got disqualified, and so we got bumped into the final. And um, and the boats, even on a good day, the boats, the other boats were, were faster than us in performance. But the wind came in and roll, and it was pretty much white capping for that final. And you know, I told my partner Dennis, you know, look, we're we're not going to do any kind of starts. We're going to build to a 28, and then we're just going to row a 28 as hard as we can down the course. You know, and our, I mean, our normal pace was 30, 34, 35. And we did that, and we're moving through, and we, we're getting around to the halfway point, and I kind of glance over, and we're right in the lead. And I'm like, holy God. And I mean, I'm telling you, you know, we should have been 20 seconds back from the guys, you know, that were in the lead based on kind of our potential that season. And, uh, and we just, and they were trying to roll 34, 35, you know, and they were trying to kind of roll it normally and not adapting to those conditions. And uh, we just stayed at 28 and we ended up uh, winning that race. And, uh, and it, it's, you know, it is kind of more of a strength and power. And, and you, I've also kind of later in my career, you know, certainly rowing at Indianapolis, mm -hmm. you know, I remember, and this will, this will kind of spawn a question too. 
you know, knowing that year that Club Nationals was going to be at Indianapolis, I usually shot away from rough water. I was mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm just going to get a quality workout on, on right. land. But that year I made a point to, to go out and train, and I was training out of Rollins down in Florida. Yep. And, uh, and that lake, you know, had rough water a lot. And mm -hmm. I just, I, there were times where I just wanted to shoot myself in the middle of a row because, you know, rowing in headwind, tailwind is one thing, but yeah. rowing in a crosswind, yeah. you know, is, yeah. is, you know, with, with a swirly lake is mm -hmm. no fun. And then got to Indianapolis and I remember in the single, you know, in the trial with, you know, my doubles partner the week before, I think I dropped like 720 or something on, on 2K at New York Athletic Club. And then the, uh, then at Indianapolis, it turned. In, it was that white cap in for the single, and I mean, I think I was like 9:15 time in terms of the speed. And it was, uh, and in that race, you know, um, I didn't learn my lessons from earlier in my career. And I was like, I'm, I'm trying to row as clean as I can. And you know, when I got bumped out, um, I was getting frustrated. I was trying to row higher rates. You know, you kind of look about those various experiences. You're know, like, you know, you have to, as a rower and as a coach, be willing to step out of the plan and mm -hmm. realize what are what are the variables that I've been presented with and how do I kind of adapt that and when right. it's rough water you, you just can't approach the stroke like that tappy stroke right. that you're going to want in calm water you know it's happening in the mid to high 30s you know if you're in that rough stuff you got to power through and that might be a skill thing I mean an elite rower might be able to do that better than I am certainly a, a men's eight is going to feel a lot better than a lightweight men's intermediate single right. you know in rough water but I'm curious because, you know, as I kind of noted there, like my tendency was always to just retreat from the, from the rough water, say, I want to get quality training right. in no matter what. And if it's rough and I think we're just going to bounce around, we're going to go, uh, we're going to train on, on the ergs. And, and that, a lot of that came from my experience that year training at Rollins and just, right. you know, pushing through the hard water. And I was just like, never came off those sessions being like, oh, I'm glad I push through that rough water, it was always like, I just completely wasted, mm -hmm. you know, 60, 90 minutes, you know, and, but then I've also, it's interesting because when I would coach in the summer, it was, it was almost exclusively sculling and there were definitely times where the singles were out there in the rough mm -hmm. water, like really rough stuff. And I mean, it's almost like a roller coaster game, right. but I think they learn so much as a single when you're in full control of everything yeah. than maybe in a four where, mm -hmm. you know, it's just you coordinate with other athletes and you're trying right. to just survive in that. Um, in, the, in the single, you, you kind of learn to just kind of relax and absorb, mm -hmm. whereas in the, in the four in that rough water, mm -hmm. you're kind of fighting because just mm -hmm. things are happening that right. Um, right. you didn't cause, whereas in right. the single, everything that's happening is mm -hmm. your cause or the, the conditions. And, and so, you know, for you coaching those fours and eights, you know, kind of, you know, what is that, what is that threshold point? You know, I know you said um, kind of pushing out, but yeah, where, I mean, where the, are you making that decision between we're going to make that push through the conditions versus mm -hmm. we're going to kind of stay it safe and, or stay indoors or. Um, to, to key on a word you just used, I think, I think, you know, you used the word survive. I mean, mm -hmm. fast rowing and survival rowing are two really different things. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you make that, I think if you make that decision to, do your work in, in truly challenging conditions, these, these very fatiguing, these very heavy or challenging conditions, um, I think it's important to realize that you're, you, that you're training a different mode of your athletes than you are if it's flat and you can just work on your execution and speed. Mm -hmm. Execution is different from surviving. I don't think, I, as a coach, I would ever, as much as we want to prepare our athletes and kind of set the table for them, and give them the opportunity to perform, I think as a rowing coach, you have a certain obligation to, d don't give in to the temptation to try to explain rowing as, as easy or not demanding, mm -hmm. because that's not true. Right. Rowing is a, is a hard sport, it's a very demanding sport, and I think that the potential for disconnect, if you tell someone, oh no, we'll just manage this and it'll be fine, mm -hmm. in effect telling someone this is not hard, mm -hmm. I think that's a lie. Yeah. And, and so I think that, that the, recognizing that, if you think about some of the ways we assess our athletes, whether it's a two mile run or various, various erg pieces, um, at some point, especially on the erg, when they're, it's them against the clock, that survival instinct will come in handy. Mm -hmm. So I think it's definitely worthwhile to press that button at different points of the year. Again, you have to be careful. You want to make sure that you're not, uh, you, you know, you're aware of the fatigue that's going to cause. And, and again, don't, don't discount the mental fatigue either. Mm -hmm. if, if you go out and you, you, you have this, 
you know, 90 minutes to two hours of, of, a, of a hard slog, mm -hmm. it wears you differently than if you went out, you had a nice warm up and you, you, you did these really fast, good pieces and then you kind of paddled in and everything was beautiful. Right. Um, uh, the, the, the slog takes it out of you. You might feel it, uh, at least mentally. Um, I've seen athletes come back on Friday from a rough row on Wednesday, still kind of hang dog and, and, and beat up, oh, coach, this has been such a tough week. Mm. Um, so you have, to be, you have to be aware of that. But know that, that you know, every so often that choice of pushing the survival instinct of your crews, again, yeah. in a close race, I would argue that, that it's not just execution that's going to get you ahead. It's, it's, that, it's that willpower Definitely. or that mm -hmm. instinct. And so every so often, again, allowing your athletes to tap into that primal thing. I, I always call it the lizard brain, you know, the, the, some of these primal instincts. Um, you know, again, teenage boys doing 100 meters on the erg, that's fairly primal. S view it as an opportunity, mm -hmm. um, but realize that the, the domino or the ripple effects from a practice like that uh, can definitely linger for, for a few days. I mean, ultimately the kids feel stronger as a result of having survived tough water days, but realize that the water adds its own degree of difficulty to the day um, in a way that, that will compound any of the work right. that you do. And I think, you know, you talked about kind of the mental fatigue and mm -hmm. I think, you know, coaches, you know, could, could stand to account for that more. I mm -hmm. mean, I think that we all kind of sit down and we have our plans and we are, are loading patterns and we're like, all right, well, this is the physical fatigue that people are kind of carrying mm -hmm. through or in the workout. And I think people just don't want to appreciate the mental fatigue that comes with various mm -hmm. trainings and a lot of times accounting for mental fatigue that's just not anticipated that, right. you know, that, you know, the circumstances changed, something unexpected right. that happened. It created that, this kind of uh, mm -hmm. this fatigue that you need to account for, you yes. know, in your training. Mm -hmm. and, and it was, is um, fascinating when I was talking to, you know, Steve Gladstone and, and he was talking about the, the need for him to be able to adapt his training based on where the students were within their academic yes. commitments, mm -hmm. you know, to, to be able to just step back. And even though, you know, you know, clearly Steve is, is coaching some of the best athletes in the country mm -hmm. of being able to, for him to be able to recognize and say, you know what, these athletes are going to be, they're not going to be as primed for good training at this time because they're focusing on these exams mm -hmm. and these academic commitments. Um, and it was really, it was really awesome for me to hear him saying that, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I think that, you know, other coaches, we, we got to get out of this mentality of just, you got to be tough and you got to push mm -hmm. through. Um, which is true in certain circumstances, mm -hmm. but there's other circumstances where you got to be like, all right, well, no, let's kind of, we got to rest right. and relax right. and, uh, and realizing that the recovery comes mm -hmm. during the rest. And that means that mental, that rest as right. well is going right. to be critical. Well, I think what, what plays along with that idea, I think in our, in our coaching, um, in general, I think, especially at the youth level and to go back it, it, to, you know, to your, your question at the very beginning, it, it is it's getting a little more difficult, I think, but I think getting away from either fear or pressure-based mm -hmm. coaching of our, of our athletes and our, and our teams. Rowing, especially competitive rowing, is, is very demanding. And I think that if you try to go down that avenue of adding extra pressure to what's already a, a truly demanding sport, you know, we gotta train harder, otherwise we're gonna lose to X crew this weekend, or, yeah. or um, you know, uh, even something as innocuous as, you know, you know, don't get sick because then I'll have to put someone in your seat. I mean, yeah. if you, if I, I think, I think fear and pressure are some of the um, worst motivators there are oh, cool. uh, yeah. from the, from the simple reason that, that again, no one, no one goes out there to do a bad job. Mm -hmm. And so if you make your coaching about just don't do a bad job as opposed to go out and do as good a job as you can. Mm -hmm. I think that's motivationally, that inversion can be, can be really, really powerful. In our program, at least, I don't think we, we talk as much, um, we don't spend as much time focusing on, say, winning or things of, of our control. And I really have to, you know, I, I have a debt to, to Larry Gluckman and a talk he gave uh, maybe, or a talk that I was at maybe 10 or 15 years ago where he, he made it, crystal clear that, that when he was coaching at, at, at Trinity, one of the reasons for his success at, with, with that program was that he really emphasized to those athletes that they were not going to worry about anything they couldn't control. 
whether that was the weather, the time of the race, the water conditions, uh, or their opponent. Yeah. You don't control anything about your opponent. So I think that listening to, to that explanation of this idea that, that your opponent is an uncontrollable, so only worry about those things we can control. It seems like a fairly simple concept, yeah. but I think most of us, especially faced with you know, a, a, a heat sheet and there's all six lanes and you start doing all your calculations, we get excited and, and uh, you know, again, our, our, our kids, you know, are, are not as dumb as, or they're not, not tuned in. I mean, when, right. when, when, as a coach, our body language and our, you know, if, if we wig out, they're going to wig out. Mm. And if, 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 if it's as simple as, all right, um, lane three, 1040, here's your bow marker. Mm. Here's the plan. Go. Um, I think that that's much that sort of keeps it in the realm of what you can control mm -hmm. in a way that's very different than looking over at lane five and four. And I think these guys, lane one has always had a fast start and, and all of that. Um, it's natural the way our minds work as coaches to want to game it out, yeah. to, 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 to sort of run the race in our heads before it, before it happens. And I'm certainly as prone to that as, as anybody, but I think I've, I've at least personally gained a lot of, I mean, you know, it's, it sounds like an oversimplification, but, but there have been a few times with some very good crews that I've had where I've been so in tune with this crew where the pep talks might have been five minutes. Yeah. So it's like you, 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 drive, you, drive the, you drive the trailer, the kids get off the bus, they rig the boat, and literally it's, all right, your race is, your race is at 11, standard warm-up, you're lane two, there's the lake, go have fun. Yeah. And, and then they would go out and they would just like come down like gangbusters yeah. and and it, it it's not always that simple some crews need more preparation than others but if you can if you can again i i found that i found that that speech by larry gluckman to be so it, it made it so clear that if, if you it, it's a waste of time to focus on those things you can't control yeah. um and i think you know I, I love that insight because you know i come from a running background and yeah. so i was cross country and mm -hmm. track and field where there is a high degree of intimacy yeah. and competition yeah. to rowing where there's essentially none you know it's like the only contact you have in competition is psychological mm -hmm. and you can shut that off if you right. want to right. um and so and it's funny that you know just when you said that it kind of clicked you know as coaches coaches are always saying you know don't look out of the boat you know don't look at your competition just keep your head forward focus on what's right. going in but yet those same coaches could be talking about, well, this other crew is this fast and they might have a good start and they might be doing a 10 and we got to respond to that 10. And so if the coach is coming into them and, and, and sharing his focus on the other crews, then it's going to be natural for those right. athletes in the situation to be like, well, what's right. going on? Whereas if the coach, you know, is, is completely focused on, on those, that, those athletes and, you know, and can kind of shut out what's behind them, like putting blinders on the racing course, you right. know, and, and just say, focus on the task at your hand, then those athletes are going to be more right. equipped psychologically right. to execute well, in that way. They'll and also be more relaxed yeah. and there's less of that pressure and fear. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Um, it's not, it's not foolproof. You, you need a plan. And I think that being aware of your opponent's strength and weaknesses, certainly, I mean, you, you'd, you'd be negligent as a, as a coach mm -hmm. to not have done your homework or not to be aware, but conceivably you share that with, the coxswain, or you build it into your plan as a as a, a, a focused move at some point. But I think that it can be it, you know it can be a real red herring to go and and put all your energy on focusing on you know this one team you need to beat or your one big your one big rival or, or mm -hmm. e even the one team you need to knock out to move on to the to the next right. level. Um, you don't want to put all of your eggs in someone else's basket. Right. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I'm curious, like stepping back a little bit more, mm -hmm. kind of onto the administrative side. Yeah. And, you know, you've been involved in in four different programs. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm tracking correctly, yep. and and so certainly each of those programs is going to have their own kind of management structure and leadership. Mm -hmm. And and for you, you know, kind of evolving as most of us do, from you know a coach within that program to a program director, right. and 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 also interacting with a different kind of administration in the sense of a lot of the, the schools have been boarding schools, you know, and then now this is kind of this mm -hmm. community access point, you know, drawing from public school. I'm curious about, you know, your experience along the way and kind of, you know, lessons that you've learned to, mm -hmm. to effectively build relationships with mm -hmm. the higher leadership, whether it's via school administration or board of directors um, right. to kind of ensure that you're able to execute 
to your full potential as a coach right. you know, within that, those programs? Um, that's, a great, that's a great question. I think that especially with, with youth sports where your athletes are, are not quite as mature and there's, I think, a different level of oversight that's required for your, say, your middle school athletes or your high school athletes. I, I, I've come to th think of this sort of as a strategy of figuring out who your assets and allies allies are. Mm -hmm. When you interact, say, in, in a scholastic environment with your athletic director, you will learn pretty quickly if they know much about rowing. And unfortunately, you know, a, a unfortunate reality too is occasionally you do run to athletic directors who don't care much for your sport. Mm -hmm. Either way, as an administrator or as a, a program director in a scholastic environment, this person needs to be your ally in some form or another. I've, I've, I've seen a pretty good spectrum in my, in my own experience, and I think that one of the things that most administrators really appreciate is, um, and it is somewhat of a cliche, but just open, open communication. Yeah. If you can justify what you're doing, justify uh, your financial decision making, your, your roster management decision making, if you can explain all of those things in a way that fit into the context of the institution, whether it's academics, discipline rules, residence life, etc., then mostly you will receive the, the support you need. I think, again, it, it, this, this can be a, a tough thing for, for many of us to realize. We're not often being hired because we're genius rowing coaches. Mm. We're being hired because someone trusts us to be the adult to run this group of 40, 60, 80, 100 adolescents in a, in a safe and productive manner. Mm. And I think that, that if, you're, if you're a program director, it's really at your peril to, to focus only on the X's and O's. It's a luxury as well to focus only on the X's and O's and not on those soft skills or those administrative skills that the people in your various offices, residence life, athletics, et cetera, will, will be concerned about. Mm -hmm. I would say uh, it, it's far easier to burn bridges if you happen to be a very successful coach and you can't handle the financial side or the planning side or the required paperwork side mm -hmm. than the other way around, where mm -hmm. if you're, you're running the program in a very competent, transparent manner that, that's, that's productive and healthy. Um, your kids are, are doing well, they're, 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 they're having a good time. There won't be as much pressure, I think, to perform. Of course, you know, the holy grail is always having both. N not everyone is always lucky. Sport works in, in very cyclical ways. Um, I think the other thing, too, is that at least I found valuable, certainly in the scholastic world, is find out who your other allies were. Um, as an example, at, at, at Deerfield, I learned very early on that some of the people who absolutely were so vital in keeping in the loop of what we were doing were the people who maintained our launches and engines. We had a terrific physical plant staff, mm -hmm. and part of their portfolio was gassing up the launches and winterizing stuff. And, and I, I found that, that with those folks, open communication, just, you know, first of all, appreciating their efforts, but also realizing that, that some of these folks were mechanical geniuses and if something wasn't yes. working, they could get it fixed like that. Yeah. I mean, there are so many times that we would have been literally high and dry if not for being able to call this person and that person. So you, I think sometimes you'll find your allies in really unexpected unexpected places. You know, the school nurse can be a, or the trainer can yeah. be a yeah. terrific, terrific ally here in Duxbury. Um, you know, one tremendous example of that is, is um, the strength coach at our school is phenomenal. And we've been able to grow our program in a very non-rowing way by having a very intelligent, well thought out strength training plan mm -hmm. for our rowing, rowing athletes from someone who, who is passionate about what he does in terms of his, his strength training and gets what we want too. And so I think that, that the idea is rather than, I mean, rowing occasionally has the rep of being str a strange sport or a difficult sport or a, a difficult to understand sport. And so I think if, it, I think it would be unwise if you're in any kind of leadership position to have a, an enormous chip on your shoulder and feel like every, you're, you're always playing defense and you're always having mm -hmm. to justify and explain and, and, and you're constantly feeling backed into the corner. 
it, it, that's probably not as, as healthy a, a situation as, as, as it might be. It's, it's worth, even though, and, and, and I'm stealing a line from um, the Cal Rugby Coaches presentation, Jack Clark, uh, who does a very nice presentation on you know, how winning teams get put together. And he has this great line in this, in this talk that was shared with, by, by Chris Kerber from Cornell at, a, at the U.S. Rowing Conference this year, where, where he says, you know, you, you don't win any gold medals for operations, um, which is, you know, are the buses on time, is the boathouse clean, uh, is the equipment in good shape? That's true, you don't, but taking care of those details is certainly one of the, the major tasks of anybody in a leadership position or making sure that they've been delegated. I, I think that, you know, going back to my early, early in my, my college career academically, I started, I started college as an archaeology major. Okay. And I was really excited and, and I, I knew my antiquities and I knew my, you know, human evolution and all of that. And then sometime in the second, in the second semester, um, I took my first stats class, the, the statistics class for archaeology. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you know, the, the teacher was very matter of fact. He says 80% of archaeology happens in the lab. And my face kind of dropped. And, and, <laughs> but but I, think, I think it's analogous to at least certainly at a rowing organization, a high school rowing organization where your staff might be, might be smaller and more people have to shoulder more of the load. Mm -hmm. As you get further and further up the coaching chain or the, the, the program leadership change, chain, it's, it's worth being aware that more and more of your time will be spent on spreadsheets and receipts and accounting and, and those types of things. Um, while they might not make your team fast, they make your organization stable. Yeah. Um, whether you're part of a school athletic department or a community-based organization such as this at Duxbury, mm -hmm. it's vital to realize that those aspects of your job start to become as important and certainly in some ways more visible mm -hmm. than any of the coaching that you do. I think it's quite different mm -hmm. at the college level. Um, you know, where, where there's more sort of support staff built in. But at the same time, I would argue that thinking about the non-rowing aspects of your rowing program ultimately makes you a better rowing coach because mm -hmm. you, you, you find ways to strengthen your organization and take care of certain key details that maybe on race day, because you've planned better and your bus is functioning, your tent mm -hmm. is functioning, and, and your equipment's in great shape, maybe that, maybe that gets you a win. Yeah, and I mean, you think you were saying that the operations doesn't create the championship, but you can't create the championship without the Absolutely. operations. You Absolutely. know, and so you know, if you, you know, if you've neglected that, it doesn't matter how good a coach you are. You know, if your engine doesn't start, you know, you're, it doesn't matter. Right. You know, you're not going to get out there. You're not going to be able to execute. You right. know, if you if you've, you know, if you've neglected the logistics of a trip, and there's a lot of stress in, in terms of getting to the venue mm -hmm. and getting into the hotel, and, and then transporting back and forth, you know, to the race course, then. Mm -hmm doesn't matter how good your crew is, they're going to suffer from all that, again, mental stress, right. you know, and, and that mental fatigue. Yeah. Do, do, you, know, do you really so. want your, your team, do you want your boat to be late to the line mm -hmm. because you weren't as diligent as you could have been about that bus? Mm -hmm. And again, at most smaller rowing programs or most scholastic programs, that's on you. That's, yeah. on, that's on you as the, as the leader. Yeah. And kind of stepping back, you know, mm -hmm. into the personal side, right. you know, and for, for me, I've been kind of on a journey of getting back into mm -hmm. to health and wellness, you know, and I, I think that that's, I had gotten to a very unhealthy place when I was at Essex mm -hmm. and two years ago, I was 204 pounds, 162 this right. morning, right. weighing in. And so a lot of health issues there and kind of getting back and, and even knowing through that time that the, the value of kind of staying engaged, staying involved, you know, and I know that, that you've managed through the years and it may have ebbed and flowed mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. kind of, you know, mm -hmm. staying fit and staying healthy as, I would like to talk to you about the process for you and how right. you found the balance right. to balance it for yourself and finding the time for yourself and finding the time as you're growing a family because I, right. I do think it is critical for coaches to, to keep that contact, yeah. you know, with, with their own health and fitness, yeah. both physically but also as a coach, right. you know, and, and I, I love the fact, and even when I, was, when I was not training a lot, whenever I would get on the erg or hop in a boat, that would still inform a lot of my creativity right. as a coach, right. you know, cause it would, it would keep me there and involved. And I was always thinking, and I think any coach out there has all, has said to themselves, 
man, if I could take what I know now and, and steal my 22 year old body, yeah. what could I accomplish yeah. with yeah. you with right, that? Right. So, yeah. And so, you know, if I can just get you to talk a little mm -hmm. about kind of the strategies mm -hmm. that you found to kind right. of make sure that you're, you're finding the time you're right. staying engaged, right. Right. Um, because I, you know, I've seen you on, you know, races and results, right. you know, right. and you're, right. you're out there and you're, and, uh, right. and despite helping with Rosie K and, and all that demands right. plus the coaching side. And so, you know, what kind of, you know, what have you learned along the way to kind right. of help ensure that you can keep a focus on right. that side of your life? Um, this is going to sound super nerdy. I love rowing. Yeah. You know, I, I, I really, I really enjoy it. You know, I, I, you know, as the weather here in New England has warmed up over the last mm -hmm. couple of weeks, like, is it time to put the boat in yet? You yeah. know, can I, can I grab a single? It's for, for, for good or ill, you know, rowing has informed so much of my life over the last, well, going on 35 years mm -hmm. now that I think it would be inconceivable to completely step away cold turkey. Mm -hmm. That said, at, at various milestones, you know, 30, 40, 50 this year, um, I've learned, I've learned a lot about, you know, n not always in the, in the, in the most straightforward way. I've learned a lot about how to keep that, how to, how to keep that balanced. Certainly there was a time where our kids were very young. It was still really easy to go steal an erg here and there. Um, once they were in elementary school, you know, certainly it, it starts to get a little, a little harder and kids are, kids are tough. And, and I think that it, 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 was, it was clear early on that I, w I didn't really want to adopt any kind of strategy where I was going to go get childcare or, or, or TV or what have you so that I could go row for two mm -hmm. hours. Um, so it was like, when I can, I will do it and I'll try to do a good job stealing, you know, stealing an hour here or there. Yeah. Um, that said, I think another great learning experience that, that I've had over the years is that and again, this is where the benefit of lots of lots of mileage and staying in touch has has has, um, has really helped is this idea that if you keep the quality very high, you're not just shoveling meters the way you were when you were 25, yeah. but you keep the quality very high. I think the level of enjoyment can stay very high, too. I mean, it's one of the most one of the most baffling and yet fascinating aspects of, of, of continuing to row, especially continuing to row in, in sculling or, or, or in, in a single over the last, I would say, 15 or 20 years has been that I remember what getting in the boat felt like after the winter in college and after college, and it would be lumpy and gross and, and you're like hitting your hands, get all torn up. And as I've continued rowing the single, Again, even if the mileage is minuscule, like eight kilometers here, 10 kilometers there, six there, because you, you've got to rush off to a meeting or whatever. Yeah. Um, that first, over the last, I'd say five or 10 years, that first row back has gotten so much better. Yeah. <laughs> it's like you, you, you get back in there for the first time, you, know, you put the boat away in November and then late February, sometimes you know, usually mid-March or, or late March, you get back in the boat and you're, you're not really missing a step. Yeah. Because it's not, you know, you're, you're not trying to, overpower the stroke you don't have trials or a race two weeks from now you're not putting an immense amount of pressure on you so so i think that and in turn that has really informed my coaching what sort of mentally what stays what 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 skills can i work on over the winter when i'm erging and i'm again i'm a, I'm a weirdo too i love erging i love erging and, 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 and so um what skills can i work on over the course of the winter mm -hmm. to sort of keep it, to keep those skills and that boat feel, that boat feel fresh. I would say mm -hmm. on that, on that topic as a tangent, um, the invention of, of dynamic ergs over mm -hmm. the last couple of years has been a phenomenal godsend yeah. because, because again, you can work on a few things as opposed to just like fanning the, fanning the wheel. And, and like you, you know, as you get older, um, simply just statistically, I think people are going to wrestle with illness or injury. I had, a, I had a fairly significant upper body injury um, towards my last year of coaching in Florida and was out of rowing for a year. Mm. Um, I had a fairly severe biceps injury and they said, I'm sorry, you can't row for 12 months. And that was really, really hard. Yeah. <laughs> and then even, and even coming back from that, where you, know, you haven't touched an oar or an, or an erg in 12 months, you get back on the erg and so, again, poking around, poking around online, I came across um, 
this amazing video of one of the Dreisiacker brothers where he talks about the effects, and you should, you should find it because it's, mm -hmm. it's a really good one, talks about the effects of rowing with the fan all the way at zero. Mm -hmm. And so the first, I'd say, six months I started, I started rowing again after I recuperated from this, from this injury. It was all at fan zero, all really low pressure. And I certainly can't prove it, but I feel like my understanding of, of connection, front end connection, of being able to pick the wheel up on very little resistance really increased exponentially as a result of learning how, forcing myself to feel that or being forced to as a, 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 a convalescent, I guess you would mm -hmm. say. And so again, I think that, and that too has, has flown back into my, has flowed back into my, into my coaching. There are times when I will have the athletes I might have them row feet out, or I might have them row with the fan, fan at zero, mm -hmm. working on just that specific notion of, of how do you find that turnaround point at the yeah. catch? How do you find that? How do you find that connection? So I think, you know, again, I think the beautiful thing about our sport is that, it, it, again, if you're curious and if you're open to surprises, mm -hmm. you can continue to learn from it, experience that, feel different things. And if you're, you are fortunate enough to, to, you know, to, to still be, to still be coaching or, or if you, if, if your life has worked out so that you can be active in rowing in various levels like that, mm -hmm. it, it, it feeds back. I mean, there's, there's nothing like being out there in a rowing shell on a, on a nice day. And, you know, you feel that motion over the, over the water. And I think again, as, as you already said, that is something that instinctively you want to impart to others. So as coaches, we remember what that feels like. If, you know, if, you're, if you're staying active, you remember what that feels like or, mm -hmm. or what that felt like at some point. And that's something that ultimately all of our athletes will remember more than you know, their medals or their wins. I mean, I, I always, I'm always surprised by when I run into former athletes and, and you, know, you get to talking about the good old times in this state or that date. They don't remember the races. They don't yeah. remember the, the races. They don't remember the results. Um, they don't remember how they did, whether mm -hmm. it was good or whether it was, they, you know, they, they can vaguely say if it was good or bad, right. but they remember what they felt like mm -hmm. on the team. And then this may be, this may be different at the high school level. Again, as adolescents and you know, your, your, your brains are sort of mushy and, and yeah. you're not quite making all those connections. But I think that experiencing that a few times also was a really good reminder for me that you know the 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 winning and the achievement might even be secondary to the feeling of what it felt like to be out in a boat with your friends mm -hmm. you know after school on a you know on a sunny day in, in April or May mm -hmm. um, I think that's what lingers with people more so than than wins which in turn has I think as a coach led me to make sure that and I, you know, I'm as competitive as they get. I, I, I enjoy, I enjoy it when my, my teams do well. Mm -hmm. But I think that reminder that if you have it in your, in your, your power to do certain things, to create an environment where your people are having a good time and they're able to spend time socially with, with each other and, and they're enjoying this whole experience, then I think you've done a great job. I totally agree, yeah. you know, and I, you know, I, I would talk to my athletes kind of at our team meeting of like, you know, I would, I would say, you know, how, if there was a varsity boys group, I was like, who can tell me who won the national championships two years ago? And they'd like kind of look at me like, uh, and I was like, exactly. Right. It's like, nobody knows, nobody cares, you know, right. anymore, except for maybe those, those athlete team. And then they're focused on the next, the next championship. And right. so, you know, what matters is kind of the, 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 the journey as cliche as that might mm -hmm. be, but you know, you know, you know, the, the relationships you build along the way yeah. kind of is key. Mm -hmm. um, kind of picking out a couple things, you know, and kind of what we talked about, you know, the, the flywheel, um, I love that. I'm a huge fan of dynamicers. I, I row on slides yeah. uh, for, you know, all my rowing right. if I can. Right. Um, and uh, the flywheel is interesting because I kind of came to that through a different path. And so mm -hmm. for me, when I was, I was coming out of the University of Florida as, mm -hmm. a, as a club team and, you know, spent some time at Malta and the New York Athletic Club, but you know, more or less did not come from, you know, a, an elite pedigree. And so a lot of my training, I just, you know, kind of taught myself, you know, and I kind of got early, early on started to get the sense that the, that the text on rowing wasn't that great. You know, it was, it was, uh, there was just, you know, I would read text and it would give and it would give these rules and then it would get an example. And es essentially the rules they were giving could not be achieved unless you're rowing 15 to 20 hours a week, you know, and there were, there were no leeway. And so I was like, there's right. something wrong here. And so I would start looking at other things. And I looked at uh, 
basically I would look at the different components of the sport and then I would look at other things that excelled in that. So if I was looking at, you know, a strength weight ratio as a lightweight, I would look to gymnastics, you know, what's gymnastics right. doing, you know, for building aerobic endurance, mm -hmm. I would look to cycling because cycling is kind of the king of that aerobic endurance. And with the cycling, I spent a long time kind of pursuing that mm -hmm. and experimenting with it and trying to understand long, slow distance and how it applied. And definitely want to say that, you know, my takeaway was as long, slow distance doesn't fit with rowing. Mm -hmm. Rowing should be a high pressure at low cadence, but uh, while I was doing that, I was kind of at a, uh, trying to adapt things in rowing to cycling. And, I, and so I went through these periods where I would, you know, put, sit on the erg and I might be doing 90, 120 minutes on the erg and I would put my damper down all the way and then I would put paper on it. So the drag factor was somewhere between maybe 65 and 75 and then I would increase the cadence and I would kind of tap it along at like a, in the high 20s, you know, maybe. And so I'm trying to get a little bit more of that kind of light cadence that you'd get on a bike and then, you know, getting in a lot of, a lot of volume with it. And, um, and it was interesting, I would go through that time and just my aerobic capacity, you know, as expected, just excelled. And I was, I would just remember how excited I was getting about how fit I was gonna be and ready to do 6K. And then, then I would do a 6K and you get about a thousand meters in and it just all falls apart, you know? And then kind of, and at the time I was just like, what's going on, I, I don't understand. And in retrospect, it was because rowing is a power endurance sport, yes. you know, it's yes. cycling is muscular endurance. And so I was training aerobic capacity. I was excelling at that. And if I rode a marathon like that, I probably would have been, you know, performing, putting up very good numbers, but it right. didn't translate to, right. you know, those running distance because you have to, um, you have to train the strength component as well. And that's why, you know, and I eventually embraced more of Arthur Lydia's type of steady state, mm -hmm. kind of maximum aerobic steady state. So kind of like a high, high effort, you know, using the cadences mm -hmm. to control it. But, all that time at those low rates, there was, there was tricks that I kind of picked up. And one is my time on the bike of appreciating that drag factor as more of a gearing. And so a lot mm -hmm. of coaches will just kind of, they'll stay within uh, one drag factor for all the training. And for, for me, I've always, I use it and I'll, you know, there'll be different drag factors for U2 versus U1 versus right. transport AT racing pay, right. cadence. And I'll use that for my athletes. And so, you know, because I don't think that there is a linear relationship between mm -hmm. your drive dynamic and the cadence, you know? And so I think that if you take the same drag that you're racing, let's say it's a, a 115 and you're racing at a 36 at that 115, well, if you shift your stroke rate down to an 18, you're, and you keep the drag factor up, you're gonna have to slow down the drive too much in order to hit sustainable pace at the 18. Right. And so I would use, you know, I've, I've always used those little drives and I use it with my athletes. Mm -hmm. And I've, you know, found that my athletes one, they perform very well in the erg for their size, but also mm -hmm. on the water relative to the ergs always right. move very well, especially in the swimming boats. And I think it came to that mm -hmm. ability to kind of connect. And so, you know, my girls would usually, you know, their steady state was generally somewhere between a 75, 85 drag factor. Mm -hmm. The boys were generally somewhere between a 85 and 95, maybe a hundred drag factor. And it, it really translated and, uh, you know, and so it's interesting kind of, you know, yeah. hearing, you know, the yeah. dry scouters talk about that, mm -hmm. you know, the quality and that connection and, uh, and how I've kind of, you know, used that and, and still kind of push it. I have a video actually on my personal YouTube page, you know, just it's me geeking out for 20, 30 minutes about, you know, the idea of, of your muscular adaptation, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, for different drag factors. Um, but, uh, so yeah, so that's interesting. I, anyone listening to play, I encourage you to kind of experiment with that a little yes. bit. Um, yeah. and I, I'm still curious, I'd love to get like an MIT, you know, guy on and to, to think about what are the exact acceleration dynamics at different speeds to, to, to connect and move the water just at the edge of where you would slip with the fluid dynamics at different right. cadences right. and right. powers. And then how do you translate that onto, you know, maybe a C2 mm -hmm. or a row perfect? I think I always find that interesting because there, there are so many measurable aspects of our sport, mm -hmm. whether it's on the erg or in the boat. Um, I've always been sort of amused or, or bemused when people take rowing and make it into a make it into a math problem. Mm -hmm. There was that great case or great, great study I, I want to say six seven years back where these British mathematics researchers found the ideal rig for a boat and it was something like I you know the, it was the yeah. battleship you know <laughs> it's like the four ports and the, yeah. there would be the least and 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 with humans in the boat, you just couldn't do it. Yeah. And, and so I think, I think there will always be, and to me that's also one of the things that um, is so real mm -hmm. about rowing is that there's always gonna be this mathematical ideal mm -hmm. um, in a way that I think 
you don't get, say, in swimming or track and field or ball and stick sports like, like you know, soccer or basketball. Like, you can't come up with, you know, an ideal, uh, you know, formation in soccer or an ideal zone defense in basketball. <laughs> yeah. um, for whatever reason, people keep coming up with, you know, and, and whether it's, you know, an ideal gearing on the erg or an ideal um, rig, rig for a boat. And what I find, what I find refreshing is, at, you know, as a longtime observer, is that you'll come up, you'll have all these complicated models, and then these human beings come along mm -hmm. <laughs> and blow that model out of the water. I mean, yeah. what, was, what was really exciting um, over the last couple of years of watching, watching some international rowing has been, you know, the, the willingness of, of some crews or some athletes to, to start rowing really, really high again. Yeah. If, you, if, you, if you watch it, say, this, like the men's eight, um, in Atlanta, uh, the winning boat was over 40 the whole time. Mm -hmm. And then you watch Athens eight years later, and the, the, the U.S. men's eight is walking away, understroking the field, 35. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, this past year again, 2019, at the world's rates are up above, you know, 39, 40, 40 again. So there's definite, you know, it, it's not a set it and forget it moment where everyone said, or after Atlanta, everyone said, all right, we're going to row 40 from here on out. No. Um, and, and so to me, that is, and, and, and I don't profess to be the greatest numbers genius or, or rigging genius, but, but as an observer, the, the, the constant tinkering and the willingness of even some of the greatest coaches in the world to take this concept and turn it on its ear and, and try something try something different. We all want the same thing. We want to go as fast as we can over our 1500 meters or our 2K or our 5K. And the, there have been enough outliers over the history of the sport to where, 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 where they've blown, you know, the conventional wisdom out of the out of the water and that's that's exciting because i think that that one of the things that that is so exciting about rowing and and being a coach in rowing is you always have that like spark of belief that anything is possible yeah you know even in the face of outlandish odds you know many of us still feel like our crews can can win in these impossible mm -hmm. situations and and there's something very very human and very hopeful in that i mean if you if you, I mean, and, and there have been so many, so many great examples. I mean, the, the French men's pair in the 2000 Olympics, mm -hmm. you know, who, who rode gangbusters 750 all the way, <laughs> all the way, all the way home. I mean, that's, that, that's a legendary race. Or again, uh, or if you watch the, the, the pairs race at the Worlds in Sarasota in 2017, where, you know, these, these, you know, the, the, these pairs are, are, you know, rowing 42 for the last 500 meters or, or what have you. And it's not just rate. It's the, it's the idea of making the impossible possible. Yeah. Um, that, that has always been such an element of our sport. And, and that's why I'm glad it's not really possible, even though we try it to reduce rowing down to pure math. Yeah. Um, it, 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 keeps it, it keeps it lively and exciting. And I know that, that what I've welcomed over the last five or 10 years, there seems to be a greater openness of people sharing their numbers. I mean, a lot mm. of people, that was one of the comments on the, um, on the, uh, the, the Gladstone excerpt that, that, that you posted where, you know, he's talking about the rig and, and yeah. people were like, oh, Steve Gladstone shared his rigging numbers. Yeah. That never happened, you know? <laughs> and, like, and, and I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, guys oh, are pulling it's, 540. It's just, it's just, <laughs> it, well, it's just, you know, it's just a number, yeah. you know? And, and this idea that, that uh, on the one hand, you know, what do you gain from, from knowing Steve Gladstone's rigging numbers? Yeah. On the other hand, um, yeah, go try it. Try this out. I mean, yeah. experiment. Don't don't be afraid to try different things, especially if you think you can help your if you can help your help your crew. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I think I've, I've most welcomed in my time coaching was that so many of our colleagues are so approachable in mm -hmm. terms of of asking questions or answering email or or you know you run into someone you know really big at a at a, at a regatta somewhere and and if you can just sort of pluck up that courage and, and be that guy and ask a, yeah. <laughs> a goofy technical question. I think that's part of the fun. I mean, yeah. there aren't that many rowers and rowing people around. And so certainly as a coach, I've always appreciated the willingness of, of you know, many of our 
colleagues out there to make themselves available for questions. And again, if I had, if I had any one piece of advice to give to a, a younger coach or, or someone just starting out, whether it's you know, in, in rowing coaching or whether it's in some kind of administrative role, seek out the people and, and, and ask questions. Yeah. I mean, there, there are many, many good people in mm -hmm. our sport and people that are, are very willing to help out. Um, I, I know that I wouldn't have really achieved anything that I have achieved without being able to ask many people for advice. I mean, you know, again, a line from, from Chris Kerber, you know, every, every great business starts with a crime. Yeah. And I think that, <laughs> that, that I've certainly benefited from, from my ability to steal things from, from many mm. other people along the way. Yeah. And I think, you know, I have found also that there, there are very few people that aren't open to sharing, yeah. you know, and I mean, and hopefully few got to coaching, you know, and in their life and relationships, you know, is that uh, if you can't handle that no every once in a while, you're probably not going right, <laughs> to have too much right. success well, on right. the relationship side. But, right, and, right. and it goes to, 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 to the rowing world too. But, I mean, there's, you know, I, I think I've had, you know, in all my experience with rowing resource, you know, and just in my own training, um, I've, you know, there's been one coach that didn't want to share, you know, a, a number. And, and one other athlete that didn't want to share a training program, right. you know, and, so, and, and I've reached out to a lot, you right. know, and so it's just, and eating in those, it was just like, oh, okay, you know, move right. on. And so right. I think, yeah, people just need to be open to, to asking, right. but uh, in the meantime, they can listen to a podcast for right. two hours on the way to Regatta. Exactly. Um, before, we, before we leave, I do want to touch a little bit about, you know, from your Road UK, yes. you know, experience, yeah. you know, and so, you know, you've been involved in that almost since the startup. So mm -hmm. back in 98, I believe, mm -hmm. and Road UK started uh, 1997. And actually, like, quick shout out, you had mentioned kind of those old websites, and I thought it was cool that, that Ed had, or maybe you put it on there on the website of, um, when, on the about section where it has a link to, like, the, the old, you know, the way the, back, the, the the way way back, back when, machine. what it looked yeah, like. Right. It was, it was yeah. funny, it was kind of flashback for me because I, I was alive back then, you mm -hmm. know, to see it. Um, right. But it'd be interesting for people to check out. But um, I'm, I'm more curious in, in kind of your, your reflections on, the the state of media and journalism mm -hmm. as it relates to our sport right. and because i th i think there's there's a lot of challenges that our for yeah. sport faces yeah. in that both yeah. in terms of 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 the news and the cycle and where the focus is and creating relatable stories mm -hmm. for the public to connect with and and um and also the marketing side yeah. you know and that you know how can our sport because I don't care what you say, you know, money is going to be the driving factor in development yes. mm -hmm. in the sport. And, and our sport really hasn't. And, and even Steve said that this is kind of the key to, for the sport to move forward is, is figuring out how to, how to monetize the sport to sponsors, to advertisers, mm -hmm. to marketers. Right. And, and so I'm curious both in terms of your perspective as a journalist mm -hmm. and, and how that uh, interacts with the sport of rowing, mm -hmm. but also just in, in media and marketing and kind of how they all kind of work together um, based on kind of your background, you know, and the biggest you know, right. news source for right. the sport. Right. Um, it's, been, it's been occasionally depressing to watch. Mm -hmm. I think that, that, I think most people are aware that, that you know, traditional news organizations, print and magazine, um, have experienced a sizable contraction, certainly mm -hmm. since you know, since the, the, say, 2004, 2005, but then really accelerated with the, the, the recession in 2008. Mm -hmm. All the culprits are known. You know, the, the, the ubiquitousness of online advertising that, that siphoned away advertising and, and classifies revenue from newspapers, mm -hmm. the, you know, production costs for magazines, certainly the, the salaries for writers and what have you. Um, I think that, that where rowing has been affected is that as newsrooms contract, sports departments have con contracted. And I had this um, exact conversation with John Powers of the Boston Globe. Formerly, he, he was, he was to, to my mind, really one of the last American rowing writers. You know, even as late as the mid to late 90s, if, say, someone, you know, an American university performed well at Henley, you would have an article by separate writers in both the New York Times and the Boston Globe. Mm. And as those writers have have aged and retired. Um, as I said, I had this conversation with John Powers, formerly of the Boston Globe, mm -hmm. um, you know, about, about the scenario. Um, I, I'd say all the players and culprits are, are well known. Um, what I think is unfortunate is that at a time when our sport is becoming more diverse, uh, there are really unprecedented opportunities for, for 
junior rowing, women's rowing has certainly you know, expanded, benefited from Title IX and, and the, the growth of, of rowing at the, uh, at the women's collegiate level. Mm -hmm. It's sad that despite that growth in our sport, the sport, the coverage of the sport itself has shrunk mm -hmm. in, traditional, in traditional media. I mean, every four years when you know, the Olympics come around, there's, there's an interest in the, the, the crews and the stories. But it, it, you're right, it really has ebbed a little bit. And you know, there, there's, there's, a, there's a need and a drive to stay relevant. And I think a lot of people, whether it's, it's US rowing or uh, media companies or, or organizations like Row2K, we, we're all wrestling with ways of how to raise the profile of the sport. I think Steve Gladstone is probably onto something when he says, you know, you have to, you have to consider sponsorship opportunities. Um, I think uh, the, the one thing I, I would hate to see, and I'm definitely going to out myself as a traditionalist a little bit, mm -hmm. is if you look at the way the rowing is going in the Olympic movement, where you know, the Olympics are adding three-on-three -three basketball and skateboarding. Mm -hmm. and I, as, a, as a traditionalist, um, we've seen this in the rise of coastal rowing, which seems you know, to look fabulously fun from a distance. But for me personally, I'm not sure if that's the best representation of mm -hmm. our sport as a competitive endurance event. And so I, I would say in some, in some senses, it's probably inevitable that we see a little bit of contraction mm -hmm. of interest. Um, and it's something that we'll have to address. I certainly wouldn't know what, what, that, would, what that would be. I mean, I, th I feel like if those of us on the, the, the street level who are coaching at the junior or at the collegiate level um, continue to make it an attractive option and a good use of time for our people, yeah. I think that that's the, that's the best we can do. I think if we, if we chase the almighty dollar too far down various, you know, sponsorship or gimmick, gimmick mm -hmm. rabbit holes where, um, you know, you, we've seen these proposals where, you know, the Olympics are going to double up and they're going to row mixed crews. And, and mm -hmm. the, it, it seems to me, at least personally, that that's, that's, that's so grasping at straws or at, at, at trying to, trying to preemptively come up with solutions before we know sort of the full the full lay of the land. I do think there are things that can be done on the local level. Um, get to know your local sports writer mm -hmm. or or again engage someone in your own organization to make sure that 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 kind of that you have that kind of visibility in your in your local in your local media. I would say on the bright side, one of the things that we are seeing is is that there are so many more teams represented out there via, say, your Instagram or your Facebook page or your, your YouTube or your, your, or your Twitter. Um, the one hazard I would say that that, that that leads to is that if instead of, instead of being somehow in the regional or national picture with your news or with that, with that photo, mm -hmm. you've put something out there for your 150 Instagram followers mm -hmm. and they all already know you and in yeah. some ways, we're seeing, I, I think we're seeing people settling for a smaller audience when mm -hmm. they should be sort of casting their net more broadly. Yeah. But I think that, that I think the big thing, uh, I think the big thing is that continuing to publicize who we are and what we do really is, is, at, the, is at the core of it. I, I, I do worry about approaches that and again, this may be very much coming from the, look, I'm a high school coach and, and there's, there's not a whole lot of money in the gig and not a whole lot of earth shattering developments if we win or lose. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying from the standpoint of, I think if, if, if at the top level, we start working too hard to repackage our sport to make it palatable for people, I think that will kill rowing. It, well, I think, you know, it, I don't even think it needs to be repackaged, right? It just, people need to understand the visibility side of, of those regattas and who's yep. attending those regattas. And I mean, Steve made a, a good point, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's the people that are attending a lot of the regattas are people with spending money, yep. you know? And so if, if, if people are just better at getting sponsors to understand and appreciate that. And I think that, you know, from the rowing sponsor side, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's tricky because I, I think that the sport is so self-contained that a lot of rowing companies don't feel the need to push a lot of dollars into marketing to right. get exposed to community, I would agree which, with you which may be true. Yeah. 
Um, but I mean, they're certainly competitive within it, you know, mm -hmm. and, and certainly more even at the, at the younger side, for sure. I mean, right. if you can get a kid thinking that, you know, your best Foley, you right. know, is more ubiquitous right. than, right. you know, this Hudson, then that's going to be advantageous. Um, or and even their son comes out. I mean, I, I'm a huge proponent of the uh, the R seat, which used to be the core perform seat. Mm -hmm. um, and I use it all the time. And it's just like there's no marketing there, you know, but and I have affiliate links on, on the kind of mine if, to get that exposure and just get people to realize what's there. I think that some companies can do better with that. But even just stepping outside of Rowan mm -hmm. and get, you know, get in those other people, um, those other companies mm -hmm. to realize, well, it might not be as wide a net that you're casting, mm -hmm. you know, within the Rowan community, you are going to have a more, you know, a greater spending uh, ability within right. a rowing community than right. you than you may if you were, you know, talking to, you know, basketball community, yeah. you know, yeah. where it's just, you know, it's a, a broader audience, mm -hmm. but, you know, you know, you're going to have a lot of mm -hmm. populations that aren't going to be able to Certainly, see. certainly CrossFit has done a lot for the visibility of yeah. rowing in our, our you know, yeah. the ERG. Um, I think that, that again, that's something to, to be welcomed because, mm -hmm. again, there, there is starting to be, to be, cro I, I, I can't tell you what, you know, how depressing it is to, to you know you go onto YouTube and then you'll see some some beast from CrossFit go 602 you know yeah. at stroke rate 24 and you're like I could never do that yeah. and and so and so it's 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 opened again it goes back to that what we what we were talking about earlier where sometimes our imagination limits what we think is is possible and so mm -hmm. I think I think CrossFitters and and their application to to their particular mo to to rowing has been, I mean, it's not my thing personally, yeah. but again, watching some of these people, you know, with, with sometimes questionable technique do amazing things on the erg, you know, it gets back to, well, maybe it's not all about how pretty we are and how, oh, how yeah. well we row. I mean, maybe there's, is something to be said for just that, that, that raw, that raw juice. So again, um, sort of to piggyback off a point you made, you know, much earlier, you know, your studies involving cycling and running, I mean, it's the one thing that I think will truly be the next, the, the next sort of quantum leap in rowing is if you look at track and field or swimming kind of at the international elite level, I often feel like the science in those sports is, is a good decade, two decades ahead of where rowing is. Totally. And I think when rowing sort of truly harnesses a, a lot of that, a more fundamental understanding of, of you know, or, Again, there's plenty of fundamentals, but a, a, a truly refined understanding of how physio physiology and how technique and how power and strength and training and all of that fits together. Mm -hmm. I think that's the next leap yeah. in 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 rowing in rowing yeah. performance. I totally agree, especially on the on the where we are in the in the understanding. Yeah. I, I you know I've and, and I would say we're kind of back more into the sixties in terms yeah. of running understanding and cycling. And I mean it makes sense because there's millions, more than millions, there's hundreds of millions of dollars that go into those sports because of there's such a big market mm -hmm. for recreational running, recreational cycling, and right. so they have more money to invest in the R&D right. side right. and the training methodology, whereas rowing just doesn't. Right. I would and say the one, the one aside is that measuring rowing has always been tricky. Oh yeah. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people say, you know, why can't you just do timing like swimming does or like mm -hmm. running does? Well, we're on, you know, windy, <laughs> you know, yeah. Eagle Creek Park in Indianapolis, and it's kind of hard to get, you know, buoys and timers and yeah, and where it, 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 water even, even yeah. GPS is not 100 percent mm -hmm. foolproof. I mean, GPS was a game changer in rowing, mm -hmm. but it's still not the panacea mm -hmm. where it makes every result dead on accurate. Oh yeah, I and mean, you have water temperature, yeah. you have water depth, both yeah. are going to change times. But there's just there's just no way to the, create that standard measurement. It, it, it's, it's still very much in the wild, and I think again. On the one hand, that's a point of that's a point of pride. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, we're not we're not cookie cutter. But on the other hand, it makes it in some ways as barriers to approach. Yeah. You can't you can't approach it. it. It's not easily as approachable for finding finding commonalities. Mm -hmm. And again, that's where again I think I think that we often don't give enough credit to to some of the people out there and some of the, the great coaches and physiologists yeah. who who've really pushed the envelope forward in terms of their understanding of, of, of training and race tactics and, and rigging and, and all of that. There are, there are a few people who are very, very good at yeah. what they do. And I think I mean, you talked about CrossFit and, and just kind of pushing those barriers of understanding what's possible, you know, and you see, you know, there are, you know, a lot of CrossFit 
doing things that are producing times faster than, than and rowing. And, uh, and I've used it myself. My, my training has shifted more to the short yeah, distances right, right. lately. Um, and I've had a, a blast just trying to completely kind of throw out my understanding of training from a mid distance perspective and be like, all right, well, how, what is the long sprint like? And actually a funny story is like, you've played a part in that un right. unconscious because right. I hopped in a, a race up at Northeast sprints. Mm -hmm. Um, and I had, uh, and I'd seen the one minute times and, right. and you had done that and, right. uh, and you were, you had the fastest meters, right. you know, over the years of doing that. And I was like, okay, well, that's my goal. You know, I'm going to set that and I would hop in cause I wasn't, right. I didn't have the time or to right. train right. for longer right. races. Right. Um, and, uh, and it kind of got me on that bent and now I've been kind of training for those distances, right. Right. but I look at the CrossFitters, mm -hmm. you know, and there, there's times, you know, a lot of them hold records for the short distance with, with concept two. And you look at that, I was like, well, they're doing that and they're, they're, there's significant technical errors in what they're doing, right. but they're, they have that power. Right. So that's, so what that means to me when I say is not, oh, they're real horrible. It's like, if they can do that with that technique, right. what can be accomplished with good technique? And so right. I'm like in there and I'm like, all right, let's go after right. these times right. now and try to get their fitness and, and my technique. And so I think that that's pushing those barri barriers has mm -hmm. got to be embraced no matter where it comes yeah. from. And uh, right. I mean, you see it with, with running too, right. you know, is that, you know, there was this fascinating article that I read a while back and they were talking about breaking the two hour barrier mm -hmm. for the marathon. And this was well before Iliad, yep. you know, started, you know, making that push. And they were, they were analyzing the various people that had gotten close and they were breaking it down into their technical skill versus the physiological skill. And they were looking at these, these people that were all close to the record or had the record and saying, well, this person is a very technical athlete and they got there, but they really, they could really push it with their fitness and other athletes that were just very weak technically, um, but you know, just had crazy fitness. And then they were projecting, well, if we can get an athlete that can do both, what can happen? And right. you know, now we know, we see right. Iliad coming in right. and, yeah. and doing that, who's right. a gorgeous runner to right. watch, right. you know, and has the fitness. And so, and I see that with rowing too. And you need, you need those challenges coming from all places to, to kind of push your understanding of what's possible. Right. Um, and so I think that that's been right. on the erg side right. have been cool with it. And I, I've heard so many high level coaches saying that they think that they figured out the physiological side of rowing and that the next barrier is really the mental aspect of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I've heard, I've heard Justin Moore say that, you know, I'm pretty sure, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, Steve was saying something right. on that, on that line as well, um, though not directly. And I'm just, I'm so against that idea. I think that there's just so much more that we can learn in terms of the training methodology. Um, I think, I think rowing. what they may be referring to, is and it always comes back to this mm -hmm. and it comes back to what we were talking about earlier with yeah. rowing not being a math problem mm -hmm. is there simply is no other sport where again other than the single mm -hmm. you are putting your fate you know your heart in someone else's hands with it, with your with your with your crewmate so i think that that when when coaches are talking about the mental aspect it's this notion of, okay, maybe there's, there's a few people in the world who can redline at X level. Mm. If, if you're in a four, say, we, you know, we, we row fours, and you have one person who's, who can redline at X level and the other three can't, you know, is the, is, is what's, the, what's the task? Is the task, because again, what, redlining, that ability to punish yourself, I think is as much mental as it is physiological. Mm -hmm. um, certainly there, there have been, in our sport, true rowers who are, who are physiologically gifted. Yeah. But I think that, that some of the, the underdogs out there, some of the, the top performers, have just had this ability to push beyond any sensible level of, of, of pain and, and discomfort. And I think that's a mental trick. Yeah. And so I think this goes back to something that, that I was saying much earlier, is that as much as, especially as a high school coach, I want this to be fun and social and we're training, we're having a good time. I will never, you know, get backed into the corner of, of, trying, to, uh, of trying to make rowing less hard than it actually mm -hmm. is. And I think again, you know, Justin and Steve may be onto something. This idea that, that if you can get more people, whether it's through training mechanisms or, or a combination of, of physical and mental preparation that can go at, at that, you know, max percentile together for longer, then I think that's when you see, you know, truly, and, and again, all of our great men's and women's crews over the last 
50 years that, that we remember, they've all had some component of that. Yeah. You know, people that have, you know, the, these, these, athletes, these athletes that collectively have, have come into the situation and all physical things being equal, they've outperformed mentally. Yeah. Well, I definitely, you know, it's that synergy, yeah. you know, between yeah. the two, and I just, I, and that's I magical. People, in our sport. Yeah, it is. Yes. And there's, and well, I, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you, an, weird I'll give you an example. Dynamic. I mean, the, and again, this I think goes back to if you're a coach, being open to surprises is one of my one of my better fours, girls fours back at, at Deerfield was a boat where I had you know some a, a good group of very very strong athletes, and then one of the the lesser performers on the team on the on the erg you know you know a a a a, a, a dancer wasn't sort of mu didn't physically look look special and yet i could put her in any boat and the boat would go and so here you have someone who's who's nearly the worst erg on the team mm -hmm. bow seat of the the first boat and they made the podium at, at any ira yeah. and again you you have to be open to that it's it's as you said it's synergy it's that it's that mystery mystery element yeah i mean uh, you know uh, i don't know how you describe that like like she was back there setting it up while the other three horses in front of her were, were going <laughs> off yeah. or maybe that's a thing yeah. maybe that maybe that works in rowing but this idea that that rowing is not math yeah. it, it takes all these elements mm -hmm. and and you need to really be open to to all of them yeah and it's yeah that openness you know it's key yeah. it's yeah be allow yourself to be surprised because yes. it i mean that's what keeps us engaged and yes. you know you know trying different things you know and learning is kind of what gets me but yeah it's uh it's it's exciting and perplexing mm -hmm. and uh you know whenever those things happen and you're yeah. just like well, i don't know how that happened right. but it's happening right. and, <laughs> and, I'm, so, and i'm glad it did yeah yeah, yeah. and don't get yeah. in the way of yeah. it yeah, yeah exactly. um but yeah so i let's let's wrap there mm -hmm. um yeah. you know uh, before we do go i do want to make an appeal to kind of those listening um to uh, please contribute to um, us on Patreon if you took value from this. Uh, we have an account on patreon.com slash Rowan Resource. Uh, you can also give at uh, gofundme.com slash Rowan Resource. Um, please support this channel, even if everybody was given a um, dollar for everything that they took from this of value. Um, that would really help drive our ability to continue producing content like this. And, uh, and the same for Ali and his involvement with Road to K, you know, also kind of this, this free source of of information out there and so Ollie, if you can kind of give a shout out to how people can support you know uh, that ab channel absolutely. and what they're doing uh, that would be awesome absolutely we, you know we appreciate all the community support that we that we receive we really you know we we're we're by and for and about rowing i'd say in the in the in the purest form whether it's linking to, to news resources uh posting free pictures of um what seems like a million regattas a year mm -hmm. uh and, and, you know, again, looking to celebrate the sport at the street level and, and from, from middle school and high school through college and the elite racing at the, at the Olympics. Really, Road 2K is, is meant as uh, by rowers for, for rowers. Awesome. Yeah, and so just find that donate button on Road 2K and, you know, kind of give a little bit. And I think it, it goes a long way to it does. keeping that content out there. But thank you, Ali. This was a ton of fun. I love talking shop. And so, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Travis. This is great. I, this is a beautiful venue. Yeah, yeah, my pleasure. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks.